You're listening to the Bible Uncut and Unfiltered. We believe the Bible doesn't need to be watered down or cleaned up to be understood. Our goal is to provide a healing place to discuss the questions you can't ask and the context you won't learn in church. I'm your host, Colin Connor. Now, on to the episode. All right, and we are live with a very special, different kind of episode here. So this will be the first time that Jana is on camera here. So this is our lovely editor. Does a, a good job making me sound a lot better than I actually do. For recording. Um, I try very hard. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're saying it's hard to make me sound good? <laughs> Uh, so you might recognize her voice from the Q&R episodes that we do, mm-hmm. um, but Jana is on here today because we're doing a little bit of a different episode. <laughs> um, we tend to focus in this podcast on really one big thing, and that is presenting the Bible in a way that you probably haven't heard before. We're trying to break down the bad interpretations of Scripture that a lot of Christians have heard throughout mm-hmm. their lives and replace it with ones that are more accurate to the ancient Near Eastern context. Uh, but I realized that in doing that, it can sometimes come across a little, well, critical, mm-hmm. because that's, well, that's kind of what we're doing, drawing attention to the bad interpretations and then trying to replace them. Uh, but we also try to have a good nuance here and a good balance. And I like to remind you that anyone can say the wrong thing sometimes and that people can change. So I wanted to do this episode because this is going to be talking a little bit about how my views have changed over time and uh, to show you that I have not always been uh, quite where I am uh, with the podcast and I don't think I am where I need to be right now either. I'm still growing. You know, I certainly haven't arrived anywhere. Uh, But after this episode, you will realize that I've come a long way from where I was before. Uh, So with that introduction, uh, Jana, do you want to say what we're talking about here today? So when Colin was in high school, correct? Yep. He decided, being the nerd that he is, I'm going to write a book. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, when I was a teenager, I also was into writing books, more fictional. But this man actually got his book published in, like, well, not (laughs) like... Published, but yeah, yeah printed, printed. printed. Um, yeah, yeah, he actually got his book printed and actually handed out copies. And of <laughs> course, I, at the time being his girlfriend, I got a copy of it for myself. Yeah. Um, and let, let me we, just... We have to give a major fringe <laughs> warning for this episode, okay? I, I am corny now, but I was very cringy as a teenager. I mean, aren't right, all teenagers, know, but teenager. but most teenagers don't try to write a book challenging the entire American church to get off their lazy butts and do something <laughs> for God. So Right, and let me just say one of my most favorite things oh, so boy. far is... The fact that he has it, you can't see, but he has it pre-signed in case okay. he hands it to somebody. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> G- giving the, the background of this from someone who was there, uh, I always liked writing as a teenager. Um, I did it a lot with school. I had a lot of projects I had to write in school, and so then I just kind of tried to write out my own thoughts on stuff. And growing up independent fundamental Baptist, most of my thoughts were about how we needed to try harder for God <laughs> and and how we couldn't really ever please him. We just had to keep working, working, working in our faith. Uh, and I was very much a preacher. I was a preacher boy from the time I was in fifth grade. That was the first sermon I ever preached. Uh, I was for Master Club, which is what we had at our church. I had to give a mm-hmm. five-minute sermon for that. Mm-hmm. And then from then on, I just started, I would preach in the children's church, the, the uh, youth group, eventually main services and everything. Uh, so this was very consistent with my character. I started writing this when I was 14. And as I recall, I think I was 18 uh, when it released. Yeah, I think you were older. Yeah, than yeah, that would have mm-hmm. been right. So it was like 14 to 17 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a lot of ministry connections, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Uh, the church I was a part of had connections with um, some big Christian colleges. Um, and then they were also connected with something called Bearing Precious Seed, uh, which if you know, you know. If you don't, you're going to say, what the heck is that? <laughs> it was a group, uh, it is a group that prints... Bibles, usually John and Romans, Mm -hmm. 
and uh, then gives them to missionaries or churches to pass out wherever they are. Mm -hmm. So we had connections there and a couple of pastor friends that I had worked to get the people at Bearing Precious Seed to print up, I don't even remember, it was like 100 copies or 200 copies or something of this. Yeah. Uh, and and so I will say, uh, I, I am not, I'm going to be disparaging my own views <laughs> in this. Uh, I do not mean anything rude to the people who helped me out with this at the time, because I realize many of them have also changed on their journey. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this was printed, uh, again, I like to make that distinction. I am not a published author at, the, <laughs> at, at 17. Okay, this was printed, not published. Uh, so yeah, 2015, that, that was uh, like eight years ago now. Uh, so the people who helped me with this may very well have changed some of their views as well. And and they were just trying to be supportive to uh, a very pretentious teenager that, <laughs> that they saw something good in. So uh, anything I say with this is, is not against them. I'm very thankful for the support they gave. Um, but yeah, I did not choose the cover. This is a very generic uh, desert road cover. I was a little bit of a graphic designer, so I, I would have had some problem with that. But mm -hmm. We did this whole thing at the end of a service, actually. It was like announced to the church that I had written this book. And so people, oh, you oh, didn't know that? No, okay. That. All right. Oh. Yeah. All right. So, so just so you guys know, nothing in this episode is scripted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have not looked at this book in about three to four years. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just going to be going through this, making comments about why some of my beliefs were toxic <laughs> and, and what I've changed in. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't even know what I'm getting myself into here. I have blocked the majority of this book from my memory. Uh, but but yeah, we actually had a thing at the end of the service one night, it was a Sunday night, announced to the church and everybody who was there that night got a copy passed out to them. Like the ushers come up and yeah, they pass out to wow. the whole church copy all yeah. Wow. Well, you you were your church's golden child. Yes. So yes, very much. That makes sense. <laughs> Everyone got a copy, and a lot of people wanted me to sign them. <laughs> so you had to pretend. Oh yeah, absolutely, I did because I had this like line of people that night. No joke. I actually had a couple of people mad at me because they didn't get me to sign the book because the line was too long that day. No joke. <laughs> I actually had someone come up to me and apologize later for being angry at me for my not signing their copy of the book that night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, Baptist churches are interesting, man. Remember, this is a 17-year-old kid we're talking about. Yeah, so so yes, I did pre-sign them so it would be easy. And, and it was always something along the lines of this. I pray this book will be a blessing to you in Christ alone, Colin Connor. And then I had my my life verse. We need to do something on life verses sometimes. We do. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mine was, you know what? I'm not even gonna say. Well, we'll just have to do that for for when we do something on life verses. You all can guess <laughs> what my what you think my life verse was, and you can put that in comments uh, or or a good life verse that you know of because there were definitely some fun ones. Do we have to get into this? <laughs> uh, all right. So the book is called Complacent Christianity. And somewhere on a OneDrive file, I have like seven follow-up books, book ideas planned for this. And they were all alliterated, you know, being a good yeah. Baptist. Oh, yeah. I don't even remember <laughs> what they were all called, but I know they all started with C and then Christianity. Oh, I've seen Christ Complicated Christianity. Something along those lines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Yep. Complacent Christianity. Um, all right. So basic table of contents. And then I had this author's note, and we have to start on this. Uh, yeah, because every every book that I had tried to write, and like I said, I have somewhere on some OneDrive file dozens of book ideas, mm -hmm. and a few that I actually started to write. And I believe it. They will never see the light <laughs> day. <laughs> but, right. Uh, but all of them, literally every single one, I began with this exact same author's note at the time, because I came from a very King James-only church. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, we would have said we were King James only, not King James ugly. Now, that was the thing back then. Uh, but yeah, so so I decided that all of my books needed an author's note on why I decided to use the King James. The book has nothing to do with the King James yeah. Bible. I just decided I needed to make this statement. Yeah, God, so, so yeah, uh, all biblical references and allusions are this book are taken from the authorized King James version of the Bible. And then I go on to explain why. Um, with over 450 full or partial translations of the Bible into the language of the English people, it may seem next to impossible to clearly discern which one is using. 
Uh, furthermore, choosing a version of the Bible for yourself is no light task. If you follow the commands in God's word, then you read the scriptures and meditate on them every day. I'm not sure where I got that from, because there is nothing in the Bible that says <laughs> you have to read the Bible every day, especially yeah. since most people when the Bible was written couldn't read. So that couldn't be a command. Right. But, you know, it sounded good. So that's the kind of stuff that we say. Well, you know, it's it's taking out the Deuteronomy of, you know, oh, you need to meditate on it. And sure. That sure. means reading it. If you're not reading it, how can you meditate on it? Right. It can't just be <laughs> that you're thinking about it. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, and then I give an example about having to write a book report uh, when you're in high school because, you know, I was in high school right. and uh, the person decides to watch a televised version of the book instead. And then they write a book report on the movie version and fail because they because, Jana, they went off of the wrong version of the story. <laughs> now, that. That was a very bad analogy yeah. <laughs> um, be, because that's not how versions work. It's not like they're trying to give their own spin on the translation a lot. I mean, some are uh, like the ESV, for example, is trying to give a very patriarchal, um, complementarian spin on the Bible. Uh, the the New World translation uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses is trying to give their spin on the Bible. Mm -hmm. But most are just trying to update the language. So, so that's not really accurate way to describe this. Um, that's not helpful. <laughs> so I say that not everything claiming to be a Bible is the Bible, um, because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 25, that every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And mm -hmm. so you're dividing Christianity by having multiple different versions. Not like it could actually help people to understand the Bible from different angles. Uh, you know, you could also throw out this, that in the multitude of counselors, there is safety and wisdom. So it could actually help to have different perspectives. Uh, I, I mentioned that version does not equal translation uh, because, you know, bad things are versions and translations are the real thing. I have no clue where I got that distinction because that's not how that works at all. Uh, let's see. Surprisingly, I do actually acknowledge that the King James was not the first English Bible. Uh, so I, I appreciate my honesty there. Uh, let's see. Uh, then I also say, oh, this, this is a good one. You'll appreciate this. Mm -hmm. The world would love his own. Rarely do we find the world persecuting or criticizing other versions of the Bible, but it often finds fault in the King James. Okay, folks, this is a good example of how when you're in... A small bubble. Yeah. I want to say a cult, but I will say a small bubble. Right. You think everybody thinks that way, and you yeah. think everybody is against you. Right. No. First off, most people who aren't raised in these circles, they don't give a crap about any of this. They don't even know there's well, a debate or King James onlyism. Right. Or honestly, a lot of them are like, why do you have so many different versions of the Bible? Like, I got asked that question one time. Sure. Like, someone who wasn't like religious or sure. like church or anything yeah but but you know they're just curious or uh, honestly if they don't uh -huh. if they're the world they probably know like the niv better than the king james or something right. so I, this was just all out of my own brain <laughs> that right there uh yeah then i make some other arguments that we'll we'll eventually do a king james series and a bible translation series uh, i don't know if that'll be this upcoming year but keep an eye out for that in the future. We'll definitely do one about Bible translation. So yeah, all facts point to the authorized KJV as being the one and only worthy English Bible. Yet so many people, Christians and non-Christians alike, still deny and reject its authority. I cannot convince anyone of truth. That is the work of the Holy Spirit alone. Above all, I encourage you to research this subject yourself and follow the perfect leading of God. Okay, can I just say that is the most passive aggressive way to make a point? Because if somebody actually said, oh, I followed God's leading and now I read the NIV, I would not have been okay with that. Yeah, no. So if you ever hear someone who says something to you like, oh, well, just pray about it and go with what God says. Don't go off of what I say. Go with what God says. That's passive aggressive. They want you to follow their way mm -hmm. and they just want to blame it on God instead of them. But if you actually try to follow God and you end up with a different way, they're not going to like that. Mm -hmm. So that should tell you they don't care about what God thinks. They just want you to follow their view. Speaking from someone who spoke that way. Mm -hmm. All right, here's the prologue. 
Have you ever started your car one morning only to discover it no longer had that new car smell? More likely, you never fully appreciated the fresh scent until it ceased to exist. Whenever my mom would complain about the smell of a car, I would jokingly reply that I didn't notice anything. Her guaranteed response, it's because you're complacent. Now, I just want to pause and say, I don't remember this. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so for all of the people... All, all 20 of you who read this book when I was a teenager, that makes my mom sound like a horrible person. And uh, she's not, I promise. <laughs> like, that with out of, out of context, just hearing, oh, it's because you're complacent. That sounds nasty. My mom is not that way. She's actually a really nice person. <laughs> yeah. So, so I apologize if, if you thought my mom was weird because of this line. I have no clue what I was talking about. Yeah, I was gonna say that does not sound like your mom at all. No, I th I think we had some little in joke between the two of us of of something. Sure. Maybe there's a sermon we had heard and we just like to call each other complacent about yeah. it. But yeah, I mean, when I, when I originally read it, I mean, I didn't take it that way. It's like she was being nasty. It was just like, oh, you've gotten used to the smell, but. I mean, I can see how yeah. that wording would Yeah, out of context, that can be weird. <laughs> yeah. So I try to say that uh, one of Satan's most effective and deadliest weapons against a Christian is complacency. And I have four facts to support this. Oh, no. oh yeah. <laughs> and then I go through these in the chapter. So first uh -huh. is that most people are oblivious to complacency in their life. Second, complacency easily leads to other sins. Third, complacency halts the growth in a Christian life. And fourth, complacency and hypocrisy walk hand in hand, and they both turn people away from God's, or from the Christian faith. So then, uh, yeah, I go through the rest of the book trying to talk about those four points. So chapter one, what complacent Christianity is. I use Webster's definition of contentment, satisfaction, and especially self-satisfaction. At first glance, this definition may appear harmless since the Bible speaks highly of contentment. However, in the Christian life, complacency is a lethal mindset and lifestyle. It can easily creep into your spiritual life. While it inf when it infects your spiritual life, your work life, family life, and private life suffer as well. So notice this Christian mindset that church and your Christian faith have to be at the center of everything that you do. And if you are not performing the most that you possibly can in your Christian life, then you're that's the reason that everything else in your life is suffering. This is why you you hate your job. This is why you're having marriage problems. This is why your kids are rebellious. Well, it's because your spiritual life is complacent. That's called toxic Christianity. That's not how this works. Yeah. <laughs> Just because you didn't get up at 5 a.m. and read your Bible does not mean that's why you're having marriage problems. Yeah. It yeah. might be because you're a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or because of any number of other factors, but yeah. I forgot to cherish your spouse. Love and respect. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we have to do an episode on that sometime today. Okay. All right. So I ask how complacency originates. And I say that it goes back to one main sin, discontentment with God's requirements or plans for your life. So then I encourage you to set the book down after this paragraph and take a minute asking God to open your heart wholly to the truth. And then I give these three examples. And I say, if any of these three examples typifies your life, immediately seek God's forgiveness and help in ridding you of the sin of complacency. Oh, immediately. Immediately. Uh, oh, yeah. Th this is such a Baptist <laughs> thing to have an altar call. In a book. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Right. Yes, in the first chapter, the second page of the first chapter, okay? Uh, depending on what tradition you came from, uh, you might not be familiar with an altar call, but it is very popular in Baptist traditions. Most uh, services will end with a call to action. A lot of them will try to bring you down to the front to make this decision, which is a whole other episode in and of itself. Uh, somebody, there's another podcast that did an episode on altar calls. I don't remember if it was for freedom or finding normal, but um, I once I find that one, I will put it on a recommended resources page on the podcast website because that is actually a really interesting episode mm -hmm. about the history of altar calls. But but yeah, this is just such a Baptist thing that I feel like in this book, I have to be challenging you mm -hmm. to make some decision. I can't just talk about something. I have to give you a call to action in it. And this is not just me. I've read several books by other Baptists. 
and they're always like self-published they usually mm -hmm. have crappy covers right. and yeah they all have the altar call call calls to action yeah in them. if you don't have half the congregation coming down the altar Just then can't... your sermon was a flop <laughs> yeah exactly and, and i know you can't see this and i'm leaving out for time's sake but almost every page has scripture on it and of course i decided that i needed to bold the references and italicize the verse wording which of course yeah that's weird it's, i don't know why we did that <laughs> so hon know. honestly if you took the verses out of this because right now this thing's like 70 pages long if you took the verses out it'd probably be like 30 pages <laughs> not quite but yeah, yeah i i just threw way too much bible in there because that's another baptist that is mm -hmm. you have to back everything up with scripture yeah which sounds good on paper until you start taking everything out of context Mm -hmm. just because you need a verse to back it up yeah and that's what happens you try, oh i need a verse to back up my position on um being complacent let me yep. just find yeah. something that fits it exactly so i say sometimes complacency starts by sneaking a glance at the greener grass of the world and coveting the secular way of life but those who seek the pleasures of the world are sure to find failure and misery <laughs> this is how normal 17 year olds talk boys and girls <laughs> I don't think this was a, a great example either because, you know, people always say grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. And if you grew up like I did, you follow that up with because it's over the septic tank. Yeah. And, and that's the idea is you're trying to say life isn't actually as good over there as it looks. It just looks better because it's not yours. But sometimes grass is actually greener on the neighbor's lawn <laughs> because they have better grass than you do. Or because they take care of it better. Like, if I'm going to use this analogy, I'm going to push this analogy. Sometimes the grass is greener because it's better grass. Uh, my parent, and I use this illustration actually in here, is I try, my parents have this really crappy type of grass. It's called zoysia. And I, no joke, this is in the book. Yeah, because I, I <laughs> yeah, because I say it's the latest to grow green in the spring and the first to brown in the fall. And and that is true. Um Whereas we were over at my grandfather's house not that long ago, and his grass, we're in November right now when we're recording this. So my parents' grass has been brown for a while. His, my grandfather's grass was green, is still green, mm -hmm. and will be for a while, because it's better grass. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sometimes the grass just looks greener. Sometimes maybe it's actually better over there. So yeah, younger me went like that, but that's worth throwing out. Sometimes the grass looks greener because you're in a cold. I say in this that... Uh, the pleasures of wor the world may look tempting and green for a time, but they quickly shed their appeal. And come fall, metaphorically, the day we reach heaven, the world's grass will be as drab and dead as possible, but the Christians will live on a sight for all to see and a testimony that cannot be ignored. But basically, all grass dies in the winter. That was a very flawed analogy. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, I also said that you can become complacent by wanting to see how the world gets away with sin. That begins the descent. However, once you know how the world operates, you have already progressed too far. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm already like, okay, what are we what are we clarifying as sin here? Like, is it just anything I feel guilty about? Or, oh, absolutely. You know, I've been that's told, how this works, Jenna. <laughs> are you going to say anything that I've been told? Oh, you can't do that, or you shouldn't do that. Right. Then, you know, well it's sin because you told me not to do it oh that's where most churches have their power though is a very broad definition of sin right and so anything that i like to preach against and i can throw a verse behind mm -hmm. oh, that's sin and so you should feel bad about it right so yeah i'm absolutely doing that kind of thing i also just want to point out that basically by saying that once you know how the world operates you've already progressed too far that's saying that if you question what life is like outside of your little bubble you're going too far mm. hi that's called a cult. Get out <laughs> now. That's not okay. <laughs> if somebody says that to you, don't don't figure out how people outside of our circle do things. Don't question that. You've already gone too far. That is not okay. Yeah. That is a cult. I was on the fast track to being a cult leader here at 17, all right? You still are. I'm saying. Anyway. <laughs> I'm okay. I, I would make a great cult leader. Oh yeah, you're charismatic. Yeah, you <laughs> you're very factual, and <laughs> people love and you. And we have a great name for it. Any of my followers would be colonists. Maybe even in such a complacent state, this Christian still attends church. 
He simply lacks an enthusiasm to exert himself for Christ. Mention the word sacrifice and you automatically suffer the loss of his attention. Or maybe it's just someone with healthy boundaries who doesn't want to spend five days a week at the church. There's that too. Yeah. I was one of those people. I was at church more nights than I was at home a lot of times. That's not good. That's not what it was supposed to be like. No. Where in the Bible was Jesus involved in 90 million ministries at his local, what, synagogue or church, whatever you want to call it? Hmm. He was. He had the uh, overthrowing tables ministry. Right. <laughs> the church shut that one down after the first meeting. <laughs> Another example of complacency begins entirely with discontentment. Perhaps you're experiencing a trial in your life and no end appears in sight. You become exhausted, fed up, and dissatisfied with your lot in life. Perhaps you've labored tirelessly for the cause of Christ. You've cleaned the church, taught in Sunday school, canvassed the town, even personally passed out a tract or two, yet no one, not even the pastor, not even the friends you've been working with, acknowledges your part in the ministry. And can, can I just say that if you spend all of that time at church and you don't get even a little thank you for it, you might want to think about changing churches. Yeah, I realize you're not supposed to do that kind of thing for a thank you. Mm -hmm. But if the church just treats you as a workhorse to do their stuff for them, especially if you have a paid church staff mm -hmm. and they're just trying to get you to go out and do all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like a business. Oh, oh well, absolutely. yeah, you're doing all this work, but if you leave, we'll just replace you with some, you know, next guy who comes along. Right. Oh, yeah, this this is great here. Maybe you're desirous for results rather than recognition. Your time, money, and effort seem not to pay off. No one you invite steps foot in the church, and the people for whose salvation you have been praying remain hardened to the gospel. The Christian life just doesn't seem to pan out, and it doesn't seem to be worthwhile. Um, maybe that's because you're doing stuff like, I said, handing out tracts, knocking on doors. That's stuff that worked 50 years ago. Yeah. Maybe the reason it's not working is because those are outdated methods and you need to update what you're doing. Yeah. But, you know, th this is the way that Jesus did it. And if it was good enough for St. Peter, it's good enough for me. Again, where did Jesus go <laughs> around knocking on doors? I don't think Jesus wants you to do that because, you know, if you knock on the wrong person's door, you know. Oh, we've got some stories about that. We yeah. should do a door knocking episode. Too. Yeah, we should. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'll, whenever Jana gets involved in this, we get the uh, the stories mm. of, of trauma from churches and the, <laughs> the things that we had to do. So, the... Yeah, we really do. <laughs> Job security, folks. We have a lot of content here. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of person, they stop trying. You still go to church, but you're the first one out at exactly 12. You still have your mm. devotions every morning, but you neglect <laughs> quiet prayer time with the Father. Oh, you still don't act like the world. But my friend, the question is not, do you act like the world? But rather, do you act like Christ? Amen. <laughs> I, I love how 17-year-old me is guilting people for going to church because that's not enough. Yeah. I literally say in here, you could be having your daily devotions, but it's still not enough because you're not praying enough. When you're not knocking on enough doors or you're yeah. not involved in enough ministries. Yeah, it, but this is how this mentality works. Mm -hmm. You can't ever reach it. Just when you think you've made the next step in the Christian life. Oh, now I'm actually reading my Bible. Okay, well, then the question comes along. How often are you reading it? Mm -hmm. Oh, once a week. Well, it should be every day. And then you hit that. Well, how long are you reading it? 15 minutes. Oh, it should be at least a half hour. Yeah. And then you have to pray more. And then it becomes, how often are you attending church? How many tracts have you passed out? Mm -hmm. And just becomes this thing where God gets farther and farther away from you with every step you take to try to get closer. Mm -hmm. When actually he was there next to you all along and wasn't asking you to do all of that stuff. Right. There's nothing wrong with going to church or reading your Bible or praying or mm -hmm. any of that. But if you think that's how you get close to God, you've missed it. Yeah. And I did. Right. And he also mentioned the people who are looking, you know, they go to church and they want to leave immediately. I was one of those people. <laughs> I'm a bit of an introvert. Um, oh, Yeah. You know, especially yeah. if I'm around people that I'm not familiar with. And I always wanted to leave as soon as I possibly could. Yeah. And, you know, you can make assumptions all you want. But eventually you have to stop and say, why does this person want to leave as soon as possible? Yep. And a lot of times it was because the sermons just made me feel so crappy or I just felt so angry about something that was said that 
you know, I, I didn't have the emotional capacity to interact with anybody else. And yeah, yeah, I just wanted to leave. <laughs> and if you have a good party or something, people aren't rushing to get out. If you have people who are rushing out of the doors of your church pretty frequently in a large amount, you might want to ask why. Mm -hmm. Because church shouldn't be a drudgery. It shouldn't be something that you just feel like you have to go to and then you want to get out as fast as possible. Yeah. There, there's something really wrong with what you're doing, if that's what a lot of people are doing. Mm -hmm. But like Jana brought up, and this is a good point too, some people are just going to do that because that's their preference. Mm -hmm. And especially we live in a post-COVID world now, so some people just are that sure, way, and that's yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I was very extroverted. That's how I was raised to be. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize until I was older that I was actually an introvert. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't thinking of introverts here. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would have looked down on you <laughs> as a teenager for not wanting to stay and talk to people. Right. Um, well, and and really the rushing to get out didn't happen until I was older. Mm -hmm. And after I'd been in Bible college and, you know, we sat in Bible college, we sat through so, 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 so many sermons. And after... Oh, yeah. Literally you know, every day we had chapel. Yeah. Day, for four, we were required. For four, well, for me, five years straight, uh, I transferred colleges um but yeah I got held back. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um and after a while there's only so many notes you can take about this stuff before you're like yeah I've already heard that before I've got that down pretty well oh yeah we joked about you could have a bingo card oh easily for mm -hmm. these sermons to the point that you could preach it as soon as you hear the reference you can preach it better than, oh, yeah. the, than the preacher mm -hmm. could up there. Because they're all the same, cut and paste. Because a lot of these guys are just looking at old Charles Spurgeon sermons. Right. Or D.L. Moody or something like that. Right. And we're we're talking yeah. within our Baptist circles. We're, oh, yeah. We're not, you know, talking about evangelicals. Because I know their sermons can be... A little a more little, interesting. Yeah, a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, a little more interesting. Every more. version of Christianity has problems. Yeah. But I will say evangelicals are at least more interesting than how we grew up. Now, some people would consider Baptist evangelicals. We were in a very independent segment where that mm -hmm. would have that would have been sketchy. Yeah. Okay. I could have all I could have raised the eyebrows of some people just by signing this in Christ alone because mm -hmm. that's you know a Getty connection right yeah. there. Yeah. We were that bad. Oh yeah. <laughs> the, here we go. Here's some good stuff right here. Mm -hmm. One of the best complacency litmus tests is your Sunday schedule. That's right. In between the week's first sunrise and its first sunset lies the mm -hmm. secret. You see, far too many people who claim the name of Christ spend Sunday for far more than just worship and rest. Sports, shopping, entertainment, video games, Super Bowl are all played, done, or watched, respectively, on Sunday. Don't misunderstand me. No hidden evil exists in these activities, especially resting on Sunday. However, weekend plans must never interfere with or supersede church. And apparently, 17-year-old mm -hmm. me firmly believed that organized sports should not be played on Sundays. Of course. <laughs> now if the flyers were on on a sunday you better believe i was still watching it <laughs> so it's oh absolutely Very absolutely I, I, ifb circles are notoriously hypocritical mm -hmm. for that kind of thing no oh, very you know we're not allowed to listen to secular music but you can listen to disney songs or weird al mm -hmm. or something like that but you know you can't listen to the song that weird al was parodying or sometimes you can't even watch the disney movie but you can listen to the music. Some people. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it varies yeah. with each, you it know, really family. Does. Yeah. So Some families are like, no, we don't do any of that. And yeah. Then, of course, I back this up with remember the Sabbath day. And I say it's Sunday right. in our case, which you can't make that. Um, eventually, we are going to do a series in Exodus. And I can't wait for when we do the Ten Commandments episode because that's... I, I say that God gave us this direct command. After all, there's a reason we don't call Exodus 20 the 10 suggestions. Funny thing about that is in Hebrew, it's actually called the 10 sayings. The word is not commandments. It's just the 10 sayings. So it's kind of closer to the 10 suggestions than the 10 commandments. But so I say no matter how little time you have, if you give time to God, he will always give time to you. Think about that. Mm -hmm. I once heard a story of two pioneer wagon trains traveling out west. One train stopped on Sundays despite their dwindling supplies, and the other drove out as if it were a weekday. Interestingly enough, the pioneers who honored the Lord's Day reached their des destination first. Whether or not the event actually occurred, the moral remains, give to God and he will give to you. Source? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's what I was going to touch on. Like, 
I'm sure this isn't just Baptist, but Baptist was our experience. They are notorious for filling up their sermons with honestly more illustrations than Bible. Mm -hmm. The illustrations never have a source. And it's just some pithy thing that if it sounds good, they say it. Mm -hmm. And if you fact checked it half the time, you wouldn't ever be able to find a source. Now, at least here I say, I don't know if the story was actually true. But I knew it would drive me nuts. And I'll just, maybe this was petty of me, but if a preacher gave an illustration in a sermon, I would fact check it right then and there. And if I found out it was wrong, I was done listening to him the rest of the sermon. Yeah. And just like, if you can't take the 30 seconds I just took to mm-hmm. double check your story, it's not worth my listening to because exactly. I can't trust the rest of your Right. Study. If you didn't even, you know, care to do background check on that, yeah. well... What other stuff are you saying that you didn't bother to do a background check on, you know? Yeah. I mean, with these preachers, the source is, just trust me, bro. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And, and you know, even if the illustration were true, it's probably because resting is actually a good thing. Like, there is wisdom in the biblical instruction to take a day to rest. But do you notice there's a difference between the Bible saying take a day to rest and go to church on Sunday? The Bible never commands go to church on Sunday. It does command, if you want to say that, but it instructs you to rest. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. But we've taken that and equated the two. For most people, church ain't rest. So if you come away from church feeling more tired than you walked in, that's not God's idea of what a day of rest should be. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I give the illustration of Chick-fil-A being, you know, closed on Sundays, but such a great Right, uh, restaurant. Oh, they do more than yeah. They make more than McDonald's. And- yeah. Chapter two: What complacency is not. Countless Christians enter commitments with the Lord during revival meetings, camps, etc. At the time, they feel a passionate fire for the Lord and then desire to do nothing but please Him. But within a month, they are struggling to remain faithful to their promise or have completely fallen back into their old way of life. And this is very typical of this mindset too. Is like we will send you to a camp if you're a teenager. Or maybe, you know, a married couple. Uh, or we'll have a, a revival service or something like that. Mm-hmm. And we guilt you into getting a, a deeper fire for God. And the circles we were in were extremely against emotional manipulation of any kind. Right. There was no syncopation. You couldn't clap. You couldn't move at all to the music. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very much head-based, very much knowledge-based and, and factual and informational. Mm-hmm. We didn't want emotion getting in the way of our mental connection to god Mm. and yet there was so much emotional manipulation in those revival services yeah and in these camps when we are putting kids or you know in the case of revival service adults sometimes outsiders because you're you're encouraged to bring people into your church for those Mm -hmm. and we're putting them in this high stress situation it's basically a sales pitch you know, we were recently looking for a, a piece of furniture and you go to the furniture stores and you have the salesmen swarm you and they're trying <laughs> to, to give you this sales pitch. They're trying to sell you on it because you get a commission on the sofa or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, sacrilegious, but a lot of preachers are just looking for their commission in heaven for getting more people saved. Yeah, no, that's 100% what it is. And so they're trying to drive you to make a decision at the front so they can feel better about themselves because mm-hmm. if they don't see people at the front, they don't think they accomplished something. Right. Can you see how this could end up being a really toxic belief system? Hmm. Here's another example of the uh, very generic terminology that you were talking about. And I quote this guy, Bob Deffenbaugh. I don't remember who he was or where I got this from. But uh, yeah, most Christians know better than to try to excuse a heathen lifestyle. But most of us also find it very easy to excuse intermittent sin. We do not try to lapse back into our heathen lifestyle, but we do want to dabble with it once in a while. If this is the case, Paul is telling us here that and that's in connection to Romans 7. Paul is telling us here that one little sin is like one fix with crack cocaine. One dose is addictive and enslaving. Thus, we must not surrender to sin at all. It is lethal. It is addictive. It is stupid. So, that you know, this is aimed at the person who thinks that they shouldn't watch a kind of TV show. But, you know, they keep going back for one more episode. They shouldn't say a curse word, but they let it out once in a while at work. Mm-hmm. And I haven't talked about an alcoholic, but someone who just drinks once in a while. You know, yeah. Right. You know, the, the, everything is like crack cocaine. Okay, but I, I don't see that happening with somebody who is abusive in the church or who is lying about something. Uh, or a glutton, you know, that's a sin in the Bible. We don't talk about that. 
Yeah, all cool. that all that stuff got pushed to the side. <laughs> right. But we went off on the movies, music, uh-huh. sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, right. all that stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, how many overweight creatures are there? Oh, the majority in Baptist circles, I'll say that much. Mm-hmm. So yeah, then I go into examples from the Bible. The first one is Lot. The Bible provides us with manifold examples of complacency and its results. If you see a teenager who uses the word manifold in a sentence, run. run. <laughs> yeah. They ain't normal. They're a nerd. So I give the, the background on who Lot was. This is Genesis 13. And I say that his problem after leaving Abraham is that he looked eastward towards Sodom. And that his sin was originally small and seemingly insignificant. He just looked at the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. He wasn't originally going to settle there, but he just got closer and closer. Sodom and Gomorrah were so sin-filled that they would make modern-day America look like a holy and righteous nation before the Lord. Okay. I I knew that would get her going. question. (laughs) Were you the kind of teenager that was like, oh, uh, if you're tempted, it's all oh, it's like the same as sinning kind of thing. If you oh, just... absolutely. Oh, and yeah. You were that kind? Oh, yeah. I was in far more conservative churches than you, but... I was more radical. Yeah. My and... church was considered too liberal for some Baptists, and yet I was the more fundamentalist of the two of us. I really... Yeah, you really were. I really yeah. Took it, took because even Kirk. I, as like a teenager, I... I mean, I, I grew up listening to Ventures and Odyssey, and I feel like I got this thinking from them mm-hmm. of that, oh, if you're tempted, it's not sinful. It's what you do with that temptation, like if you act on it. Kind Which of. is surprisingly a good thing. Adventures and Odyssey mm-hmm. doesn't have a ton of great content. Which, uh, Perfect Imagination Station is a great podcast for that. <laughs> if you are interested in that and you know what Adventures and Odyssey is. Uh, but every once in a while, they had little glimmers. That's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty confident I got. I mean, I could be wrong. Yeah. I could be misremembering, but yeah. Source. Source for that illustration. <laughs> so yeah, I, I continue with the story of Lot and how he didn't initially settle in Sodom. He just pitched his tent near there. He lived on the outskirts. He didn't want to get involved in the wickedness of the city. He just wanted to enjoy some of their prosperity. So notice notice this us versus them mentality of there's us few righteous ones, and then the whole world is against us. Mm. And some people try to leave our circles and just go on the outskirts of the world. Well, if they left your circles, there might be a reason for it. Like using this example of Lot and Abraham, I'm assuming that Abraham did everything right here. But if you actually read the story, the reason Lot Lot left is because his servants were fighting with Abraham's servants. So there was some kind of conflict going there. Now, maybe Lot didn't make the best choices after this. But it wasn't necessarily sinful or wrong for him to leave Abram. And in fact, if you read the story, Abram wasn't even supposed to take him with him initially. So there's nothing wrong with Lot leaving. It's what he did later that starts getting into bad stuff. (laughs) But, you know, I just want to paint him as a villain here. And then he dwelled in Sodom. And I quote a preacher saying, by the time Lot lived inside Sodom, Sodom already lived inside Lot. (laughs) You know, that's the mentality of once somebody leaves, well, they were already gone to begin with. They had been dabbling with this all along. Mm-hmm. And and you know what? In a way, there's actually some truth to that because you, you get these preachers who, you know, someone will leave their church and they get ticked off at it. And like, oh, well, they were living this secret life. The majority of people in your church are living a secret life because you keep preaching against normal stuff mm-hmm. and they feel like they have to hide it. So if they leave and you see them posting stuff on Facebook, they were probably doing that the whole time they were there in your church too. Yeah. And they just didn't feel comfortable being who they could be in Christian liberty Mm -hmm. because of how you would treat them. So yeah, that's not great either. While still in Sodom, Lot may have retained precious few of his godly morals. But by the time God decimated the city, Lot had lost the faith he once held dear. Moreover, his life of sin influenced his impressionable daughters immensely. Having been brought up in the world, they learned to live like it and caused their father's life to end in misery and guilt. Uh, Now, if you don't know what I was referencing there, go Mm -hmm. read the story of Lot because uh, it's uh, quite R-rated there at the end, which, of course, 17-year-old me didn't want to go into in this book. If only 17-year-old me could hear the podcast now (laughs) that I've talked about. Uh, But... 
but yeah, you don't actually get in the story that Lot lost his fate. Like, yes, his life doesn't end well, but the Bible does actually call him righteous, which is really frustrating to a lot of Christians mm. because they want to preach against Lot and, right. and just like this say, well, you can't leave the fold and go towards Sodom. And yet the Bible says he was righteous even living in Sodom. Mm. And it's really interesting because the the good guys, quote unquote, in the Bible story aren't that good. There's, in fact, a lot of times it's the quote unquote bad guys who act better. Mm -hmm. uh, so just because they were in God's line that he chose doesn't mean that they were always making the right decision. Uh, and just because they weren't the one that God chose doesn't mean they were always making wrong decisions. God went with Abraham, but still called Lot righteous despite all of that. Mm -hmm. so, but you're not going to usually hear that in church. Then, of course, I have to go to King David and talk about his adultery. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time, which is a really bad way to talk about somebody who raped somebody else. That's yeah, not helpful. Yeah. He saw Bathsheba lusted in his heart and continued in his sin. Then he attempted the ultimate cover-up. He lied, sought to morally degrade Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, and finally murdered him. Complacency leads to other sins. Well, I mean, at least you weren't blaming Bathsheba. No, I don't think I ever had that view. I sure okay. hope not. Yeah. If you, <laughs> I know we're getting a little spicy here today, <laughs> but, but if you were in a church <laughs> where the preacher says that uh, Bathsheba was at, in any way at fault for being raped by David, leave immediately. Don't even let him finish the sermon. Mm -hmm. Get up and make a point of it because that is abusive yeah. and will allow other types of abuse in. David raped Bathsheba. King David, golden child of the Old Testament, was a rapist. Yeah. We should not be uplifting that no. or, or excusing it in any way. No one's uplifting it, but right. we, we shouldn't be excusing it in any way. Yeah. No, she was not at fault. He is responsible for his actions. And yeah. His you can't tell a king no. And especially not as a woman in an ancient context. Right. That's not how that works. Right. Well, and I'm, I'm saying just, you know, there's still people today, you know, you might think, oh, we've moved past this, but there's still people today who say, oh, if a girl gets, you know, molested, raped, whatever, it's her fault for mm -hmm. dressing X way. Ugh. No, no, it's the man. The man is the one who did it. It's he's responsible for his actions and thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. We need to get into that at some point. That, that's a huge thing. We grew up in purity culture too, so we have all of those effects. So basically, I just use David as a way to say that even if you're complacent, you can eventually be forgiven and get back on track because, mm -hmm. you know, David was forgiven by God. Right. So this is a warning reminder to those in authority in the church, whether they be a deacon, usher, Sunday school teacher, or even pastor. Those whom God places in positions of authority must answer to him for any of their wrongdoing that leads others astray. That's actually not a bad point. That's probably the best thing I've said in the book so far. <laughs> But of course, I just use it to guilt you into making sure that you always do right, even when no one is watching, because God is. Of course. Mm -hmm. Chapter five, complacency in the Bible with the Pharisees. I explain a little bit about who they were. They were hypocritical and ultra obedient to the law of Moses. I say some people possess a knack for understanding the scriptures. God has blessed them with a desire to delve deeper into his word and learn more. Such a person is an increasingly rare blessing. Well, 17 year old me pat myself on the back there <laughs> however a growth in knowledge can produce a growth in pride in spirituality and in complacency but you never struggled with pride oh, no, at all not at all i was oh. the most humble person i knew <laughs> <laughs> you can easily gain a holier than thou view when you know a lot about religion in most cases you don't even realize you have such a spirit and yeah you you definitely did not have a holier than thou oh i knew that i used to but by this point i had arrived you know i was good <laughs> I, I wasn't nearly as prideful as i used to be uh -huh. <laughs> i wrote this before i met her she can tell you how much of a prideful jerk i was oh. still at that time i try to make a difference between man's wisdom and god's wisdom of course which isn't really that great of a point especially if you think that all truth and wisdom flows from god and in a way it all comes from him so Depending on your doctrine, that might not fit. I gotta say that this one, this was probably the best chapter in here so far, which isn't saying much, but no. 
Mm -hmm. uh, chapter six is the Gadara Jews. And this is Mark five with the maniac of Gadara. Jesus casts the demons out. They go in the pigs. The people in that region are ticked off that their uh, source of income is gone. Here's a good part in this. So complacent were these people that they actually rejected their religious beliefs and sacred heritage in favor of the world um, by claiming that they were hurting pigs. I said that they had rejected their religious beliefs since pigs were unclean animals to Jews. We don't actually know for sure that those people there were Jewish. They could have been Gentiles hurting those pigs. So that's an assumption a lot of people make. Yeah. But... And and somehow I see that as going after the world. I because mean, they're hurting pigs? Yeah. And, and on top of that, the Bible doesn't actually ever say that they couldn't own pigs. They just right. were unclean animals that you weren't supposed to eat. Right. So if you were an entrepreneur and kind of guy, you could raise pigs for other people. Right. And you would just have to go through the ritual to be clean again. Right. And if even if they were Jews, that doesn't mean they followed that. That's another very interesting point, is that actually the, the Bible, as we have it, presents the ideal that these people saw. But a lot of people didn't actually live that way or follow those same ideals. But that's a whole other conversation for me. Of course. <laughs> here, here I go. This, this is where we get good. Oh, yeah. People tend to be very protective of non-religious preferences. Try telling a New Yorker that Philadelphia has the best sports team, and you'll quickly see what I mean. If we're so quick to defend our favorite athletes, why don't we act similarly with our faith? As someone who is actually a Philly sports fan, <laughs> I do not ever recommend that you defend your faith the way we defend our sports teams. But we're basically bang getting back to the Crusades at this point. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> that, good. Uh, you're, you're back to the Spanish Inquisition. And nobody expects that. But yeah, it, it's not good. All right, I'm a hockey fan. We go to a, you know, a, a fight and a hockey game breaks out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't. I've seen more fights in the stands and parking lots in Philly than I have in the actual hockey games. So don't don't defend your faith like that. Yeah, I don't think Jesus wants us no, to have a not, not at all. Um, Christians today are very easily swayed from their firm foundation by contemporary movements, easy believism, practical atheism, and seemingly every wind of doctrine. No, not the easy believism. The easy believism. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't heard that in a while. Basically, easy believism was a way of just saying that people who say, all you have to do is believe and you're saved. That, that was like an attack on that, which most people would say is actually kind of the gospel in the scriptures. So, yeah, it's it's just stupid terminology to fight other Christians and say, oh, well, they they just wanted to claim to get saved and then keep living how they want to live they don't want to actually change their life right maybe they don't want to change their life to fit your version of how you think christianity should be but when you think your version is the only way christianity should be mm -hmm. there's no other options right yeah right though you may claim to believe in god the way you act testifies to what you truly believe so often we live as if there's no God. We shun witnessing, sin without fear, neglect times of prayer and Bible reading. I, uh, I'm so sorry to to the three of you who read this. When I was, <laughs> I'm so <Three>. sorry. <laughs> uh, Christianity desperately needs men and women, boys and girls, and young men and young ladies who are willing to stand unmovable for their beliefs and not follow the crowd. Mm. You know what? Don't stand unmovable on your beliefs. Like, seriously. Don't. Question them. See if they're worth believing. Be open to other ideas. The second that you say, this is the line I'm drawing and no further, you have cut yourself off from ever growing. You are saying, at that point, I have determined this is what is true for the rest of my life. So if you ever say, here's the line I'm drawing, I'm never going any further on my beliefs. You're saying that you have reached the perfection of your beliefs at whatever age you're at. That's not healthy. Like you got it 100% right the first time? The, right. You know, whatever time this is? Yep. I go on to guilt people for not sharing their faith with their coworkers, you know, risking getting fired right. for the gospel. Because that's totally not harassment. Yeah. My last Bible example is the Church of Laodicea. Oh, not this one. I knew we'd get to this one. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, this entire chapter is wrong. This is a perfect illustration of why you need to know the ancient context of the Bible. Because you can say something that sounds really catchy, mm -hmm. but completely misses the point. So in the Star of Revelation, God has these messages for the seven churches of Asia Minor. Uh, all of that is for a Revelation series someday in the future that, yes, we will get there. But John gets this message, the one church in Laodicea, and they were generally the idea is, you know, they were complacent. Christianity. <laughs> and so that's the name of the book. book. Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> so basically, the message to them is you're not hot or cold. I wish that you were hot or cold. You're lukewarm, so I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Right. Some people who grew up here in that actually have had like some traumatic experiences from that. Hmm. I was just listening to a, a podcast recently where the person, the the wife doing the podcast said that she was so scared of this, mm. of getting to eternity and God saying, oh, you were lukewarm. I'm just spitting you out of my mouth. Right. That she had to be in therapy. And like it got down to once they realized that was a key fear she had mm. and they addressed that, a lot of her anxiety went away. Wow. Like these beliefs can affect you mentally, physically. It gets into the fiber of your being. Yeah. And you might not even realize that's what part of your core issue is yeah yeah for sure so i yeah if, if this kind of sounds like stuff you've heard before i might recommend going to see a therapist who who has experience in religious trauma because you might have some stuff to talk with them about mm. but but yeah the general idea with this story goes that god is saying i would actually rather you either be totally on fire for me or you actually be ice cold don't give a crap about me mm -hmm. because you're lukewarm it's in between it's no good I would, and God is actually saying, I think I say it in here somewhere, that God basically says he would rather have someone totally who doesn't care about him rather than a lukewarm Christian. I, I know it's in here somewhere. But the whole reason that this is wrong is because I didn't realize that in that region of what we call Turkey today, where Laodicea would have been, there were two cities on either side of it. One had hot springs. Mm -hmm. The other had cold springs. Hot water is useful. Mm -hmm. Cold water is useful. Mm -hmm. But by the time the aqueducts brought it to Laodicea, both of them had just petered out to be lukewarm. Mm -hmm. And in the ancient world, lukewarm water can be dangerous mm -hmm. because they didn't have purification like we have today. So God wasn't saying, oh, I would rather you be ice cold, don't give a crap about me. Mm -hmm. both the cold and the hot in this instance were useful. And it was only the lukewarm that wasn't. So the whole point goes out the window that God would actually rather you not care about anything than go half-hearted. It doesn't work. I'm not entirely following because okay. <laughs> if it's not useful, if the lukewarm isn't useful, then doesn't that kind of reinforce the point of... Okay, of the passage, yes. But yeah. the point that I was trying to make and I've heard other preachers say, uh -huh. is that the the ice cold isn't any good either. Uh, but God would rather you be totally against him uh -huh. than for him half. I okay. Okay, I see. So in other words, you know, don't don't just go to church and drop five bucks right. in the offering plate. Like you have to be fully on fire for God mm -hmm. or nothing. Mm -hmm. Not the in-between isn't worth it. So I was trying to push everybody to either one of those extremes. Right. I was trying to push you to be on fire for God and let the other ones peter out to be totally cold to him because, you know, the middle doesn't matter to God. When in reality, that's not what this what is talking about. Talking it's about. not a hot and cold in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't work. Yeah. Bad illustration. I have a whole chapter on complacent adolescence talking to teenagers about why they need to do more for god a teenager talking to other teenagers yeah okay yeah oh yeah absolutely mm -hmm. i was being josh harris right here basically and saying oh you need to do more for god you can't you can't just you know live a normal childhood right you have to totally give all of your time for god right
The teenagers of America must learn to kneel, how to kneel before God again. Rebellion has no place in God's will. His position, he positions people in authority to lead, guide, and protect. They are representatives of his power and authority. The Lord necessarily and purposefully appoints authority figures, even when they do not always live up to their role. God blesses obedience to those in authority, and he curses the abomination of disobedience. Does he now? <laughs> yeah. That's setting you up to follow some toxic and abusive leaders. God does not bless obedience to abusive leaders. He blesses leaving, that sort of thing. Yeah. Just one time listening to the world's music, just one time clicking on that website, or just one time hanging out with that friend starts the snowball effect. But one time is never truly one time. You know, that is such a dangerous message because we all screw up. Mm -hmm. We all do stupid things. And if the message you hear is one time is never one time, you get in your head that now, well, I screwed up. I guess I am going to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And so you have in your head now, I'm going to keep sinning. I'm going to keep doing whatever this is that I'm not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes things can compound and some things are actually addictive. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, you have the power, the self-control, the ability to turn your life around. And to make different decisions. I'm not talking about someone in addiction here. I realize that's a whole process. But, you know, I, I talk here about, uh, let's say, clicking on that website saying I'm talking about pornography. <laughs> if, if you're someone who doesn't want to look at porn and you do and you think, oh, now I'm in the spiral of it, you're more likely to keep going down that. Mm -hmm. But if you think I can make a different decision. One time doesn't define my life. You're better able to follow out your values. But th this is the kind of message that we hear a lot of times. It's one time is never one time. It's a slippery slope. And so while you think that you're keeping people away from the sin, you can't keep people away from sin. People are going to do things. But what you're doing now is you are conditioning them to think that they can't come to you when they actually do. So if you are a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, a parent, and you're listening to this, Please do not teach this kind of thing to people under you. Teach instead that you are going to mess up. And when you do, I'm here for you. Because this message that once you mess up, you just keep going. All that does is drive them further away from you when they inevitably do cross a boundary. Mm -hmm. We got to get into the music. I have uh, a whole section here on music. I do. You do. I do because I talk about Ezekiel 28 and uh, the fall of lucifer mm -hmm. which i think i may have addressed on the podcast before lucifer wasn't even his name that's a whole other thing um but yeah i say that he was originally a musician because tabrets and pipes are tambourines and flutes and so if this is the case a musician from heaven would most likely have a rather extensive knowledge of the field when lucifer's pride enveloped him in sin he became satan as we know him today that's right. not how the story of the bible goes at all but all right <laughs> At that point, he would have taken his knowledge of music and adapted it for sinful purposes. In short, he knows how to use music strategically. But wait, there's more. If secular music does not attract the soul of a Christian teenager, then the devil employs Christian music. <laughs> Almost anything can take shelter under that umbrella now, but comparatively few songs that do truly praise the Lord. Anything containing Christian words to a distinctly secular beat is not of God. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But how many Christian controlled playlists include such music? I do not imply, however, that contemporary automatically equals evil, for Christians today are still writing God glorifying music. It does not in literal dictionary sense mean upbeat drums, electric guitar, raise your hands to Jesus. Trouble begins when the title contemporary describes the type of music rather than the time period. The devil's Christian music focuses your attention on contemporary praise. In other words, talking about God while gratifying fleshly human desires, allowing yourself even an occasional opportunity to listen to such worldly Christian music slowly erodes the barriers of your Christian conscience. So which group should a Christian avoid? I'm afraid the answer is not that straightforward. God does not provide us with a list of what music to listen to, and in most cases, Christian artists have some acceptable songs and some unacceptable songs. Furthermore, music is not just personal preference. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to guide our decision-making. 
in the area of what we listen to. So here are seven questions that have helped me discern what music oh, is glorifying. No. <laughs> yes. Seven questions. Seven questions that you have to ask. And, it, All right. and it's seven. Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> could be six. This has to be seven. Right. That's a good Baptist. Uh, All right, so everybody, pull out your Spotify <laughs> and run your playlist through these seven questions oh, no. and let us know in the comments <laughs> if it fits or not. Number one, does this song glorify God? This question automatically eliminates non-Christian music. Okay. <laughs> Number two, does this song include the name of Jesus? This may be an old-fashioned idea, but I believe a Christian song, a song supposedly glorifying to God, should talk about him. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, wait. wait. Let, okay. Let's get through the seven, and then you can okay. parade me up and down for this. <laughs> Is anything about this song anti-Christian? Christian is a word that can have no fellowship with rock, rap, metal, hardcore, or hip-hop. And I just want to say, for those of you watching. <laughs> All right. I'll also point out that I spelled rap with a W. What? I did. You spelled it with a W? <laughs> I'm a grammar Nazi. I had this book proofed by some of the most strict grammar Nazis of strictest. See, there we go. That's all by some of the strictest grammar Nazis I've ever known. And yes, yeah, somehow that still got through after several revisions. Christian yeah. rap, W R A P. Yeah. Number four. What is my favorite part of this song? The actual music or the words? The highlight of the song should be the verbal praise of Jesus, not the guitar solo at the bridge. I basically thought that, like, music itself was not somehow okay. Yeah, apparently. I remember if, um, somebody, I was having a conversation with a kid, and I know he listens to this podcast, so if you are listening to this and you remember this conversation, let me know, because hey, buddy. <laughs> I, I would laugh if you actually remember this. I kind of hope you don't. <laughs> Um, but I remember we were talking about casting crowns and it was around the time I wrote this book. So I would not have been very good, very yeah. okay with casting crowns. Yeah. Um, and he was talking about until the whole world hears, which if you know, casting crowns, that's basically the closest thing to a metal song they have. It, it goes hardcore more than any of their other songs, particularly at this one amazing guitar riff. And he said that was his favorite part of the song. And I'm like, well, there you go. That's how you know that song's wrong. Because you just like the music and not the words. Yeah. This is why I'm saying people can change, folks. This is no joke. I'm not making this crap up. This is how I was as a teenager. It's bad. Yeah. So basically, 17-year-old you was like, oh, you enjoyed that piano solo? You're wrong. How dare you? <laughs> okay. Well, we also came from a tradition where you couldn't clap for the music stuff have the the specials in church right because that was giving glory to the person instead of the, uh, yeah that's stuff, hard to, so, yeah. so yeah that's all you had to, fitting. yeah you had to say amen. amen so you know i didn't grow up in a family that listened to classical music or really instrumental music much at all maybe a little bit at christmas so if i had actually thought that went through a little better yeah because i don't know that i would have been against classical like i've never loved classical music but i don't think i would have called it sinful right but Oh, you like how the music's right. That's what I'm saying. Is this. I would have had to rethink this point if yeah. I'd actually thought through that. I didn't yeah, think far enough through that. Yeah. See, things can sound great in your head, but when you actually get a little experience out in the world, and I mean literally a little experience, all you need is a little bit outside of your bubble. Yeah. You can start to realize how ridiculous some of your views are. Yeah, I would. I would like to throw in there too. Uh, my mom is still very conservative. IFB. She read the book and she was like. He has a lot to learn about stuff, <laughs> and that's rich coming from her. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I thought she was complacent saying that. Right? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not you. It's person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Do you want to throw in your your point from earlier too? Since we've paused here. Listen, I'm not talking about just contemporary songs. I'm talking about the hymns here. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. I would have included hymns in that for sure. There are some hymns that I'm pretty sure don't mention Jesus. I can't think oh, of. Oh, absolutely. Or like God by name yeah, kind sure. of thing. I'm, 
I can't think of any right now. Maybe there's like some Christmas ones. Put them in the comments if you think of any. Yeah. There, um, there, there are. There have to be. Maybe like Silent Night or something. No, well, uh, no, the Dear Savior's Birth. Um, there are. Yeah. Hey, you guys, find some. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know how I'm many sure. hymns don't mention the name of God and they should be ripped out of the hymnals this week. <laughs> Just go right. to... Go to church. You know, we put these out on Sunday. So if you're listening to this on Sunday, next service, you're there. Find that hymn that doesn't have God's name or Jesus' name mentioned in it and just rip it out. Do your church a favor <laughs> and, and save right. him from that. Right, because so. a 17-year-old told you to in his book. <laughs> yeah, that's, you didn't think that one through. Or maybe you did. I don't know. I mean, I was, I was a radical. The, right. This is major, major bad fundamentalism right yeah. here. Yeah. Not that there's really a good fundamentalism. No. This this shows you what fundamentalism taken to its natural conclusion is. All right, you want to hear point five, Jana? Question five oh, you should ask yourself. Yeah. What is my motivation for listening to this song? If everyone else quote, unquote, suggested you listen to a the, the number of times I use scare quotes in this is ridiculous. What is my motivation for listening to the song? If everyone else suggested you listen to a particular song, that song most likely goes against the grain of godly praise. <laughs> if a song is popular, it doesn't please God. So amazing grace doesn't please God? <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs> Okay, that's why I said most, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. Apparently, I need to run. <laughs> Colin, is this song too popular for me to listen yeah, to? Yeah, it might be. It might be. Right. Check how, how many listens it has on YouTube. It's over 30. <laughs> it's sinful. Okay, and what is most ironic about this is when he got to college, there were some churches we went to where they sang songs that you had never heard before. Oh, yeah, they would life. literally go through the hymnal. Yeah, and like, he's like, literally. he's like, I hate him when we go through the hymnal and we sing these songs and we don't know. Okay, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I was trying to slam contemporary Christian music. Is all I was trying to right, do at this yeah. point. Um, fail. Here's six. Yeah, seriously. What reputation does this artist have? If the singer or songwriter plays or listens to worldly music or lives a worldly lifestyle, how can he properly praise the Lord with secular filth in his mind? Well, I guess you can't ever sing it as well ever again. Oh, yeah. Don't don't touch the sacred cows, Jenna. <laughs> for, for those of you who don't know, after It Is Well was written, the the um, couple that wrote it basically went off and started their own cult. And honestly, a lot of the hymns were bar tunes uh -huh. or written by people who you would never invite in your church if you're from the kind of church we came from. Yeah. That's, yeah, like we lift up these hymn writers and yet if they actually lived today, we would have been considering them heretics. Oh, absolutely. But because a couple they... hundred years makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I mean, they're using the contemporary music of their day yeah. to write God honoring music. Yeah. But yeah. But we can't do that today. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, God stopped um, blessing music about 300 years ago. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And number seven, how does the artist present his music? Do the singers sway back and forth? Do they look like a secular rock band in clothing and haircut? Yes, that's actually in here. Is the focus on the praise or on the desired recipient of the praise? The desired recipient of the praise? Yeah, in other words, don't focus on the song. Uh -huh. Focus on the one you're singing to. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, so, the, this was only because my church was connected to West Coast at the time, uh, Lancaster Baptist Church. And uh, at the time, Paul Chapel had this big thing about like any of the singers on the platform had to be in a very specific outfit and they couldn't move at all. They had to stand very stiff with their arms at their sides. There could be no movement. And it became a whole thing in my church, too, where you'd have someone who would like tap on their knee while they were up there because we had a team for, for a while and there would be like three to five people up there. Mm -hmm. And you'd have someone who would occasionally tap on their knee mm -hmm. or, or, you know, just raise a hand or, mm -hmm. or just the slightest little, not even a sway, but, you know, just the slightest yeah. little thing. And, and yeah, that was causing problems for some people. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you look at that church today and they're like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I put a whole chapter on music in here. 
mainly for teenagers. Actually, no, this wasn't a chapter on music. This was the teenager chapter, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that was the teenager chapter. And I just took half of the chapter to talk about music because. Right, because that's what teenagers struggle with most. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to talk about sex in it, right. apparently. Oh, how things change. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're not going for the E on this one. <laughs> and then I have a whole nother chapter here on complacent adolescence. Again, uh, on how it appears. Because yeah. how dare these children not be involved in 90,000 ministries? Well, this one's about how they have bad attitudes. Oh, oh, kids have bad attitudes. And how they view church as just a social gathering, a time to talk with friends. Right, because... It isn't a church a social gathering? <laughs> like, isn't that the idea? Like, yes, yeah. we're there to worship God, but... Right, well, and these kids have no choice whether they're there or not. Right, they so they might as well talk to some friends. Right. But that's that's typical. I'm not happy that you're here. You have to be here paying attention, hands folded, taking notes. Right, just like you were as a child in church. Well, yeah, I had notebooks for sermons where I would actually take notes and see that. <laughs> yeah, we were actually required to at, at the college we were at for, was it the orientation class? We had to take like three weeks of notes or something. Um, like as a whole, they didn't require you to take notes, but it was highly recommended. And I, I'm pretty sure the orientation class that required it for like your first three weeks of the college. No, that was for devotions. devotions. That yeah. was for devotions, yeah. which... Fun fact, at the time, I wasn't doing devotions because it was freshman <laughs> year. So I your just... your uh, degree's about to get repealed. <laughs> so, but... It's crap anyway. No, no one from the college is, is watching. Uh, no. no, if they are, hey. Hey. <laughs> um, but no, so I just I just wrote some random stuff like about Jonah or something. I was like, oh yeah, I'm reading a Jonah today. <laughs> Do you have those notes? anywhere because if i had to go through this you have to go through this we have to like read off some of your old notes uh classes. you know what it might be on my computer because i keep every i keep a lot of stuff it took me a while just to get rid of like class notes that were sitting around all of her class notes were just doodles about this cute boy that was in her class anyway <laughs> they Okay, so if you're a Christian adolescent, I advise you to examine your life honestly. Who says adolescent? That's such a boomer thing to say. A 17-year-old <laughs> that sucked in your mouth. If you're a ute reading this, <laughs> I advise you to examine your life honestly. Would your parents approve of everything you do? Are you only listening to, reading, watching, and saying that which is God-honoring? Are you on good terms with everyone in the church family? Do you truly care about being in God's house? If you answered no to any of these questions, then you, my friend, have fallen into complacent Christianity. Wow. Oh, it gets, I can blatantly say that because I once had to answer no to all those questions. I, too, have experienced a time in my life when I was spiritually distant from God. <laughs> <laughs> you have reached spiritual perfection at age 17 the angst <laughs> that these teenager feels over following oh, god when you're in a cult wow. yeah and, and do you notice how broad these things were too yeah do, do you would your parents approve of everything you do are you only listening to watching saying that which is god honoring if you're in this kind of uh culture you're going to be constantly being told about how all this stuff is sinful. So of course your answer is going to be no. Right. It's like, it's like the old days of um, Tom Farrell. He was a, an evangelist. He passed away a few years ago, but he was an evangelist popper, popular in IFB circles known as double barrel Farrell. Cause he had this angry, angry preaching style. He was an old IFB like um, tent meeting kind of preacher. And he was very popular uh, with the colleges that were in our circles, but he was notorious for giving um, altar calls mm -hmm. that were so generic, you had to go. It was, it was a joke. Like if you had, there are stories of some of I would do this and some of my friends would do this. If you had someone who had never heard him preach before, he's about to go into the invitation, the altar call, and you nudge the person there and you say, get ready to go up front. I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, just wait. And then whatever his altar call was, it would basically be something along the lines of, if you have ever been closer to God than you are right at this moment, come forward and we can pray for you. Like, 
any person in this environment is going to think, well, yeah, there was some time I felt closer to God than I do right now. Mm. You know? So it was just this way of getting more people to the front. Again, emotional manipulation on a huge scale. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not trying to be rude about the guy, especially since he's passed. You know, he did a lot of good. But by the same token, I have to call out that was emotional manipulation. That was wrong. And even if it accomplished some good things, that doesn't mean that the method was right. And that's the same kind of thing I'm doing here, where if you shoot broadly, you're going to hit something. Oh, yeah. And so you're going to be able to convict somebody of something and, and just convince them that they need to change something. Yeah. And with that, you're saying, oh, does do your parents approve of everything you do in your life? Like, I don't know what, you know, what the kid listens to, you know, the the CCM music or whatever kind of thing. The but CCM music? It's not like a boom. <laughs> We're listening to the CCM here in this house. Yeah, what if they listening to CCM music? And, but... <laughs> we caught them listening to the CCM. Oh, the CCM! Can you shut up? <laughs> okay. Oh, All right. Good. All right. <laughs> what if they're listening to CCM music, but their parents are fine with it, they don't care, you know, they're listening to CCM, then, you know... Well, now I've guilted them in addition to that. Right, yeah, but, you know, I mean, obviously the kid's going to be conflicted, like, oh, we listen to this music, though, but this guy's saying it's wrong, right. and, you know... See, that was the thing in those circles, is you're always going, not for the least common denominator, but for the highest bar possible... I guess, sure. like, Christianity should be more of the least common denominator. Do you believe there's something special about this guy named Jesus? All right, we're both Christians. We can go s from there, you know. Uh -huh. But it became about raising the bar the highest. So you might not listen to um, CCM, but then you get somebody who comes in and says, well, you shouldn't listen to music with drums in it because drums are sinful. Mm -hmm. Or you so, so then, you know, you have to ditch... Ron Hamilton music, which some people actually somehow thought that Ron Hamilton was too liberal. Patch the pirate if you grew up with that. If you Did grew you? up with if you grew up with it, you knew that. He had drums in a few, some Did of his you? later ones. But uh, just like a very okay. just like a military drum beat kind of thing. Same thing with Waddles. Right. They just had this like military drum beat in a few of their songs. Yeah, and of course people got the knowledge oh, yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. I could I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean so it at the college I transferred from, they were like, oh, you can listen to Ron Hamilton, but only up into this certain, like, year or time. Period. If you don't know what we're talking about, YouTube Ron Hamilton, at, at Ron Hamilton after this, and you will be shocked at how conservative his most well, progressive song could possibly be. Like, yeah, the, it's, it's children's music. Yeah, there was, um, because he was Patch the Pirate, and there was one, it was the, the Sneaky Sheik, that was the name of the... <laughs> that doesn't sound racist at all. <laughs> there was a song from the Sneaky Sheik that was... I, can't take this. It's like, I didn't grow up on Patch the Pirate, so when I hear some of these names, I'm, I can't take it, I'm sorry. Uh, the Sneaky Sheik was one of my favorites, though. <laughs> okay. Please stop saying that <laughs> So there was a song in that uh, episode or what was the show. CD <laughs> that okay. uh, I don't remember the name of the song, but it was very epic. It was like, um, you know, sing hallelujah, ba 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 ba. Yeah, it was one of those where you could like and easily that was like clap along. Too much for and, some yeah, some people were. I mean, my mom was fine with us like listening to it. But yeah, she said, "Oh yeah, people got upset about that." I was like why it's ridiculous <laughs> it really is the stuff that christians fight over uh, okay so after i challenge you to get on your knees before god and correct your mistakes with him and those you've offended i move on to the effects of complacency and to determine if you have ceased or decelerated in your christian growth <laughs> yes be, uh -huh. because it can't just be that you've stopped if you if you aren't moving forward you're moving backward uh -huh. there we go again with you can never just be you always have to be striving, pushing for harder, better. Mm -hmm. Here's the question you must honestly ask yourself. Okay. Do I look forward to going to church and do I learn from my time there? Not, no. No, no. <laughs> no, Jenna, you just passed the complacency test. Here's a book for you. <laughs> this will help you. You are complacent. Uh, wow. Well, hmm. 
it, it's so interesting to me that I equated your Christian faith with how you feel about church. Hmm. Those are two very different things. Yeah. Now, I, I realize going to church and meeting together as a community is a very important thing for a lot of Christians around the world. But that is not the same thing as your walk with God. Mm -hmm. There are, I mean, today we live in America where you've got a church on every street corner in several parts. Mm -hmm. So you can. So, you know, we live in America where you have churches all over the place that you can go to. But throughout most of human history, not every town had a church. Sometimes people just couldn't go. There are parts of the world today where you still can't meet with other Christians mm -hmm. because of persecution mm -hmm. or just because there aren't other Christians in your area. Mm -hmm. There is no church there or something. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say that church is unimportant. It is important for a lot of people, but it is not the same thing as your Christian faith. You can have a walk with God separate from any given local gathering. And that that's a big problem to equate your walk with God with how you feel about church. Because God does not bless every single church out there. Just because the place has a cross on it doesn't mean it's actually happy with or approving of what goes on there mm -hmm. or what is said there. Yeah. So maybe if you failed this test because you don't look forward to going to church and you don't learn from your time there, maybe that just means you need a new church. Yeah. But no, of course, the problem is with you. Right. At least that's mm -hmm. what teenage me thought. Yeah. Because back in chapter one, we called church attendance an indicator of growth, but you must also factor in your attitude about church attendance. Mm -hmm. and it's, this becomes the whole thing of, you know, like our parents would say, I'm sure you heard this growing up. Maybe not all parents do this, but Baptist ones do, is that you have to respond joyfully. You have to obey joyfully. It's not just do what I say. It's do what I say and be happy about it. And that is emotionally abusive. Mm -hmm. And and good people can do that. I'm not saying your parents are horrible abusers if they said that to you. But somebody can do something abusive without being a horribly abusive person, depending on what the action is. But yeah, that, that is really emotionally abusive because what you're teaching these kids is you have to fake being happy. Mm -hmm. And you can't feel sad around me. You can't be upset about something. Well, it's natural to not want to do your chores. It's natural to be a little pouty about that. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to require obedience to what you said, but it's another thing to try to control somebody's feelings about what you said. Yeah. That's not healthy. And that's not something that you can or should be trying to do. But that's absolutely what I was saying here. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. And you know what's funny with that too is as much as that gets preached, nobody ever points out the parable that Jesus told about the two sons whose father told them to work the field. And the one says, nah, I'm not going to do it. But then he goes and does it. And the other one says, sure, I'll do it. And then he doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, well, which one pleased the father? And the, everybody there says, well, the one who said he wouldn't do it, but actually did. And he goes, yep, you got it right. Mm -hmm. So apparently doing the right thing still counts, even if your attitude is wrong. But, you know, why listen to Jesus? It's not like he founded this movement or something <laughs> listen to your preacher instead right uh, i go on to guilt everyone in church by saying that uh, if you don't look happy in church you're scaring away visitors somebody could have just like lost a relative or something that week and just be sad from that right or just be having a bad day yeah, like, yeah. spill the coffee in the car you know there's yeah. lost their job mm -hmm. anything could have happened and now I'm telling you, once you step in the doors of the church, you got to be happy. Here's how you fix complacent Christianity. Tell us, Colin. How do oh, we yes. fix it? The all-knowing oracle of 17-year-old me says you have to keep a heart of repentance and a teachable spirit. Mm -hmm. And you will soon find yourself returned to the joyous service of the Lord. Not a relationship with him. Back to your joyous service the of him. service. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just like God forgave David, he will forgive you. Should you be aware of any sin in your life, this means you are still under the convicting influence of the Holy Spirit. Even now, you can get back on track. The way that you stop being complacent is you just ask God to forgive you for it. No, well, amen. Sorry, God, I'm complacent. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go on my very merry way now. That doesn't change anything about no. your attitude. <laughs> no. How do you fix your problem? You say, I'm sorry for it. Okay, well, that's a nice first step, but mm -hmm. that was the whole step, according to me. sorry you yeah. think I'm complacent. <laughs>
You can tell she grew up with siblings because that's how you apologize for something to mom and dad when you get in a fight with a sibling. <laughs> Here's how to avoid complacent Christianity. Oh, do tell. Well, first you need to be in Bible study and prayer. Amen. Because you never did a Christian who studied his Bible and prayed every day end up complacent. Oh, or oh never. Or abusive. Skinny. Or yeah, yeah, simple, yeah, no, yeah, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. You can't truly have faith in God if you don't have faith in the power of prayer. And then I talk about what we should pray for. Let's see. We yes. should pray for a spirit of contentment. Mm -hmm. We should ask for a teachable spirit oh, wow. for any of the areas where we're skirting complacency. Of course. And we should pray for motivation to remain passionate for God. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the Bible teaches us to pray for any of those things. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Uh, let's see what the other potent weapons are. Oh, um, yes, please. The second step is keeping what I like to call the John attitude. Oh, no. Why is it got to be John? <laughs> yeah. Because, and then I go on to quote a pastor that I know. In the first, yeah, in the first three Gospels, the writers referred to John as simply John. However, in his own Gospel, John always called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. John never got over the fact that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So we have to follow John's example and never forget the day that we answered God's call. So basically, just keep reminding yourself about why you became a Christian in the first place and you'll be good. Third step is put others before yourself. I'm not sure how that helps you not be a lazy Christian, but okay. And then there's one last piercing step to ensure victory over complacency. Piercing step. Piercing step. Yeah, wow. not a regular step, a piercing step. Uh, that sounds painful. It does. It makes me think of uh, a quiet place where they're going down the, the steps to the basement and there's a nail on the step. Yeah, that's just what I think of that now. That was a piercing step right there. <laughs> Every Christian, from the youngest to the oldest, from the strongest to the weakest, must evaluate his own life. What temptation is being overlooked, shoved in the corner so as not to be noticed? Is it friends, music, television, internet, social media? What exception endures in your life? In other words, what do you read, listen to, watch, post on, etc. that could lead you astray, yet you still frequent it? Is there something that contains sin, but you skip over it? For instance, there may be an extremely entertaining R-rated movie. You would hardly discuss it with your pastor, but you still watch it and just skip over the bad stuff. Or perhaps there's an otherwise good song or video that has a curse word in it. Even if you press mute, where do you eventually draw the line? <laughs> this well, is what we grew up in. This is the stuff we heard all the time. Uh-huh. Yeah. I just want to say, like, the Bible includes a lot of stuff that needs to be bleeped out, so. Yeah. Uh, so by that, you probably shouldn't be reading the Bible either. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean... And where's the room for Christian liberty? Like, I've just told everybody, here's where you have to draw a line. If you have ever read the Prophets, Song of Solomon, Revelation, Judges, those would be hard R's bordering on unrated director's cuts if they were ever made into movies. Right. But apparently all that stuff is wrong because 17-year-old me said it was. Which, I might add, was right around the time I was watching my first R-rated movies and watching <laughs> shows that had cursing and all of that other stuff, yeah. You didn't even take your own freaking advice no. in the book. No, that's the thing is, the louder you talk about it, the more you're able to hide the stuff you feel ashamed of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you, if you ever have someone in your church who is ever, like, the most outspoken opponent of something... You can usually guess that that's actually something they struggle with. Hmm. Because the louder you talk, the more you're hiding the voice in your own head that feels guilty over it. I wrote a book about it. Hmm. Here's the epilogue. Finally made it to the end. Through this short study, I hope you have grown to understand a little more about the simple yet deadly sin of complacency, which binds millions of professing Christians today. I earn... It's so condescending, millions of professing Christians today. <laughs> right, well, because there's not millions that are genuine Christians. Oh, no, absolutely not. It's maybe a hundred? Yeah, probably. Like, I mean, she's being facetious, but <laughs> we really did believe in a very small remnant. We're like, maybe there are a million true believers in the world. Like, who knows? 
but yeah like you tell me you go you're a christian but you don't even go to church or you you Faith. go to a catholic church or even mm -hmm. a non-denominational church or something right southern baptist church yeah you might not be saved yeah or you smoke fake oh yeah absolutely watch our rated movies yeah fake I earnestly pray that God has convicted and restored at least one person through the reading of this book. He definitely amused some people through the reading <laughs> of this book, I'm sure. Now remember, complacency originates with discontentment. Always be satisfied with what the Lord allows to come your way, whether good or bad. But don't try to fight Satan on your own. God has promised never to fail us or forsake us for a reason. And then I give an index of the few sources. Uh -huh. um, one of them happens to be Wikipedia, so every college teacher ever would hate me for that. Right. Um, I have something from www.av1611.org. <laughs> of course you do. Yeah, that, that was in the King James section. Uh -huh. And uh, that was about an illustration that's actually not even accurate. Right. Um, and I had another one from BibleBelievers.com. Oh. Section, yeah. Uh -huh. Webster's Bible. Dictionary. Mm -hmm. um, Bible.org. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Bible.org. A book published by Bob Jones. Uh-huh. A book from Summit Ministries, which is also a very mm -hmm. conservative uh, Christian thing, basically aimed at making teenagers radical Christians. Uh, Vine's Expository Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Mark Rasmussen's 101 Tips for Teaching, Practical Advice for Everyone Who Imparts Truth. Yeah. Okay. And then a special thanks section to all the people who helped me get the book printed. Oh, do we do we want to read the about the author? Oh. There is an about the author oh, at the end. Funny. <laughs> Again, I have not read this in a while, so I'm scared what yeah. this actually was. Because I'm pretty sure I penned this oh, for whoever put this up. Colin Connor is a homeschooling senior scheduled to graduate from Bob Jones Academy in the spring of 2016. At the age of five, he accepted Jesus as his personal savior and has been involved in local church ever since. He currently serves in the junior church and master club ministries at his home church in New Jersey. A Philadelphia sports fan, Colin particularly enjoys watching and playing hockey. Other hobbies include writing books and short stories, studying apologetics, reading, and making balloon animals. Which, yeah, if you didn't know that about me, I am actually a balloonologist. I haven't practiced in a while, but yeah, I did actually do balloon animals. And, and I do have a comment on that, on that about the author too. Uh -huh. Believe it or not. All right. Is is there anything about my personality that was missing from there, Jana? <laughs> about your personality? I mean, yeah. it was just. If, if there's anything that describes something I like, what would be listed? Well, Star Wars. Yeah. You. Oh, you didn't put Star Wars in because of how controversial it is among Spatists. Is that right? <laughs> so, I, like I mentioned in here, uh, I was a part of Bob Jones Homeschooling Academy, and they had a yearbook that would go out with it. I have it somewhere. And they would ask you what some of your interests were mm -hmm. for it. And I wanted to put down Star Wars because I have been a Star Wars nut since yeah. like 2005, mm -hmm. roughly. I'm sorry, mom. <laughs> my, my mom wouldn't let me mention it because she thought that she, that, <laughs> she thought that, that people would be upset that uh, I actually watched Star Wars because yeah, there's there's you know space wizards in it and a, a little bit of cursing. There's like five curse words in all twelve movies, even with the new ones included. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, Leia in in the oh, bikini uh -huh. yeah so i was not allowed to mention uh that i liked star wars so again my mom is a wonderful person and uh now she doesn't give a crap <laughs> no uh i don't even know if you remember that mom again i apologize but but you know a, a, a true godly christian adolescent obeys his parents in all things uh -huh. so i want to make right. sure that well, honoring my parents. <laughs> and if you were really, if you were really following your own advice in that book, mm. you would be so convicted about watching Star Wars because of the cussing mm. and the ungodly music. In uh, it. <laughs> you're right. There's, Jesus isn't mentioned. <laughs> Darth Vader's march does not mention Jesus. No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> oh. Same thing with the what was it? The creature in the um. 
uh, in the bar that was oh yeah yeah you know, I don't yeah that. swaying in the cantina uh -huh. yeah, yeah you're right yeah. yeah so if you were really living out that book you mm -hmm. would you would be so confused. and i mean there's a bar in the first place in star wars so that's right that's wrong right mm -hmm. not to mention and i have actually heard this this was real mm -hmm. the good guys in the story are the rebels so that's enough to tell you star wars is of the devil yeah yeah mm -hmm. Jana, you have any uh, including remarks on this little time capsule in the teenage colony? Um, I hope it doesn't get spread any further. <laughs> yeah, no, I've I have actually legitimately burned a couple of copies of this book. Oh, have uh, you? oh yeah, oh. yeah, it was symbolic for me. It was a healing experience <laughs> for me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> she thinks I'm joking. <laughs> uh, no, no. no, there. I mean, I literally had this is no joke i literally had box a full box possibly more mm -hmm. that i took to my college with me as a freshman and i tried to get the college to sell it in the bookstore yeah. they did not <laughs> they did not and i'm so thankful that that just fell apart um, yeah yeah i did hand this around there there were people from new jersey to california who got this like it was shipped out oh. yeah it was shipped to someone to a pastor i knew out in texas when I knew out in the Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it was Indiana, but it was somewhere out that way. Okay. And then there was there was one out in California way. So yeah, it, so sorry. Florida. Yeah, I know it went down to Florida. Yeah, yeah, wow. it it was rough. But yeah. again, the the reason that I wanted to to go through this, not just to make fun of myself, but to show that people actually can change, and that we need to be gracious with people on their journey. You know. As someone who has come a long way from where I was just eight years ago, it's easy for me to think I've arrived now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't consider myself a fundamentalist or a Baptist, but it's easy to keep that fundamentalist mindset mm -hmm. of, oh, now I've got the right way and now I've got to convert you to my right way. Well, that's the same thing you were when you were a fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. So fundamentalists aren't just on the far right side. They can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's important to be reminded of this so we can stay humble in it and also just walk with people on their journey just like you don't want them if you're listening to this i'm guessing you're the type of person who doesn't want them shoving their beliefs down your throat you also shouldn't be doing the same to them and we have to let people be where they are grow mm -hmm. and that takes time mm -hmm. because chances are you didn't start out where you are now i didn't start out where I was now. And if you had just found this random book, you would never think that I would be doing this podcast now. Mm -hmm. So anyone can change. Let this be an encouragement to you for the people you know who are hopelessly stuck <laughs> in some form of toxic Christianity. Anyone can change. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need you to be that same kind of person. Uh, it just walk with them on their journey be a space that they can ask the questions that they probably can't ask in their church or around their other friends, direct them to a podcast like this or, or, you know, a resource like this that gives different perspectives and just love people for who they are, even if they're not quite where you want them to be yet. Anything else you got? Um, well, uh, I was going to ask, don't, are, weren't there people who were still asking you for a copy of that book to this day? Uh, I think recently. I think the most recent time I was asked was about a year ago. Okay, um, yeah. But yeah, there were some people who, it, it's a very small group that that ever knew about this book, mm -hmm. thankfully. But for the few who did, I, honestly, I think it was just that they liked me because I grew up in that church. I was mm -hmm. most of these people knew me from the age I was five, so you know they're just thinking of me as little Colin that they mm -hmm. knew. So that that's all it was. It colored it, but yeah. but yeah, they. Uh, they were still looking for it and thinking it was good. And I was like, oh, yeah, oh, darn, I don't have any more of those. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let us know your thoughts on this. Um, you can email us. Uh, you can uh, send us a message on the website. You can comment on the videos or on the posts. Mm -hmm. uh, let us know what you thought of this because there is a lot of content like this out there. Oh, yeah. um, not just stuff written by me, but you know, stuff written by other Baptists that we could talk through i have a huge library of ifb books he's not joking he really does no i really do and i need to get rid of some of them and talking through them might help so if you're interested in that kind of thing talking through maybe uh some different 
books or mm -hmm. stuff like um Patch the Pirate or things like that, we could yeah. uh, start kind of talking through some of our history in those movements. Let us know. Let us know what you mm -hmm. think of that. Um, Jenna, you want to give the sign off until next week? Uh, stay curious and keep asking questions about the uncut and unfiltered Bible. You've been listening to the Bible Uncut and Unfiltered. We hope we provided a healing place to discuss the questions you can't ask and the context you won't learn in church. If you enjoyed the podcast, would you take a minute to share it with a friend? You could also rate and review on your podcast app. If you'd like to donate to keep our work going, you can go to our website, thebibleuncut.com, and click on the Support Us tab. While you're there, check out the recommended resources and blog where we post show notes and other articles. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.